Hey, it's Prerag and this is episode 2 of Many on the Laura All Will Drive series. In the last episode, I left you all on a cliffhanger. It would not start last time. Many of you did have assumptions about what would have happened. We did too. Assuming it was battery related, ECU related and whatnot. We went as far as to replacing the ECU, but nothing changed. What was the problem you ask? The stupid HP FP wanted some attention. That's it. Ram forced started the engine by pouring fuel straight into the intake and just like that, the HP FP was properly primed and all worked well. Sometimes things as little as these can cause delays. This is just one of the tantrums thrown by the car. Anyway, let's get on to today's topic, which is transmissions. I went with the petrol DQ250 all-wheel drive transmission out of a Skoda Superb 3.6 VR6 for this car. How did I end up here though, when clearly I had shared with everyone that I have purchased a Yeti gearbox which was all-wheel drive compatible? Let's discuss just that. There are a few parameters to look for when choosing a tranny for your all-wheel drive project. Number 1. Gear Ratios Gear ratios will be fuel dependent, that is, a diesel car's gear ratio will be different than a petrol one's. After I opened the diesel Yeti transmission, I saw that it had 70 teeth on the differential, and the petrol transmission for these cars have 60 teeth. While the circumference is same, I could not tell if the rest of the gear ratios would be different. I assumed they had to be different as diesel and petrol cars have different power bands. One offers torque in the low end while the other offers power in the higher rev range. Knowing this, I was more inclined toward using a petrol car's transmission. Number 2. Manual versus Automatic Eventually, I wanted to make this car an automatic because it shifts faster and the expenditure to use the Yeti's manual gearbox versus installing an automatic transmission right away was ending up being pretty similar for me. So I went with the automatic all-wheel drive petrol DQ250 instead. One can go with a manual, but in my honest opinion, if you manage to find or import an all-wheel drive DQ250, take that instead. What makes these transmission all-wheel drive is this, the transfer case. Its purpose is to send power to the rear differential where the Haldex will decide if it needs to be sent to the rear wheels or not. This transfer case sits right in front of the tunnel where the exhaust currently is. This tunnel will now be used for the propeller shaft which connects the transfer case to the rear differential. So after we are done with the conversion, we will need a new custom exhaust as well. Now that we have the transmission selected, let's see how we can mate it to the engine. As it comes out of a VR6, the bell housing is different and VR6 specific. So to mount it to the 1.8 engine, I got another DQ250 out of an older diesel Superb and opened it up. Both of these being O2E DQ250s were very similar. So I started to work on replacing the bell housing of both of them. Putting the bell housing on the diesel one over the petrol DQ250 would make it so that it mates with the 1.8 engine. Opening the transmission was an ordeal of its own. There were almost 25 or more spline bolts around it and a couple of circlips which were very difficult to remove and put back on. There is one circlip holding on the cover for the clutch packs. This does not have a lot of tension and can be removed just by a screwdriver. The cover can then be pushed out by using leverage through the starter hole. There are three more circlips here that need to be removed before the clutch pack can be pulled out. There are two on the outer side which are low tension and can be pulled out with a screwdriver and the final one in the middle which needs a circlip tool. I bought the tool which I could find locally but I ended up buying a couple more as this was just not doing the job. I barely got this circlip removed with which I could pull out the entire clutch pack. I kept everything in order with the clutch pack as these act like shims for clearance and I did not want to mix these up with the other transmission. I then started to work on removing the many spline bolts all around the transmission. 
soaking them in WD-40 and then heating up the threads hoping they will loosen easily and not get stripped in the process. Most of them are on the face of the transmission but some of them are on the back side as well. After successfully opening them all up except one, I grinded down the bolt so the head could be separated from the stud. And then I got stuck on this one circlip. My tool could not open it up easily. There was not much space and this circlip had a lot of tension on it, making it very hard to remove. Without this, the transmission could not be open. I did not just have to do this once, but twice as I needed to open the other transmission as well. After some persistence, it came out. This is the bell housing or face of the diesel DQ250 which will mount to the car. I gave it a quick wash, it then needed to be modified in order to accept the transfer case. It structurally had 4 mounting points except they just needed to be drilled and tabbed. Rest this collar needed to be trimmed to the correct size to accept the transfer case and seal it properly with a new seal. We had the VR6's bell housing as the reference for this job. This is CSR Racing's machine shop. I bothered them a lot throughout the process of fabrication as the transmission needed a lot of fine adjustments which only they could do to the micron level. Here I got the bell housing modified according to the VR6's bell housing for the transfer case. Once it was all done, I test fitted the diesel's customized bell housing over the VR6's base transmission and it all worked well. The VR6's transmission had a differential with extra splines on the very top which made to the transfer case. Without this, the transfer case is just a dummy. And this is why all-wheel drive transmissions are unique. It fit well except there was about a 2mm gap. Later even that was machined down. Although in hindsight only replacing the bearing rays for the differential would have solved this 2mm gap. Anyway, it all worked well in the end. New seal was put in and I started to put the two halves together. This is not the end however, the mystery still remained on how do we made this transmission to the engine. The flywheel used by the engine has to have 8 holes and should made to a DQ250. Such flywheel is found only in petrol cars which were offered with a DQ250, that is the VRS230. But it is not very easy to come by a regged VRS230. A new flywheel was for 58,000. If it were a diesel car, a bunch of diesel cars, older and newer both are offered with a DQ250. So those flywheels which have 6 bolts are abundantly available. But for our purpose, the only options were to purchase it new or to try to import it. Because I am on a budget and do not have all the money in the world. I went to eBay for rescue and after a couple of weeks of searching, I came across an ad from Canada. I shipped that flywheel right away to my sister and begged her to send it somehow. A friend of ours then carried it to me after a month. After which it could be mounted to the car. 
Once I test fit the flywheel, I almost had tears in my eyes. I was not sure if my research was correct, if this would work or fit. It was a gamble and this had us waiting for almost two months now. Anyway, with the flywheel sorted, we need to power the transmission, make it communicate with the car and drive it. For that, I had to do a lot of wiring. I decided to take up all the wiring in one go, that is, wire in the held X, secondary fuel level sender, and the transmission and its gear selector. You will watch the fuel tank installation and held X installation in the next video. This video is just about transmissions. With the two DQ250s I had, I had taken their connectors as well. After some research online and with some softwares I had, I started to work on the wiring. Making wiring looms is therapeutic and tedious as well if you want to do it neatly. I tried my best to keep it as close to OEM schematics as possible and routed the harness all along the original harness of the car to keep it neat. Wiring is pretty basic, just give it power and can bus. Wiring the DSG requires some wires to be run to the BCM and diagnostic port and even the gear selector needs to be wired entirely with the same power, ground and canvas. Overall, it's pretty simple. Nothing can be tested until power is given to the car and everything is mounted. So at the very end, when rest of the things were done, we gave it power. To my surprise, no fault codes showed up. I was expecting something or the other to go wrong because I had wired it all from scratch. Oh, one tiny problem though, it did not start. The starter showed no signs of life. It was a starter out of the VR6. It should have been running fine, but it did not. I knew the car would not let me win entirely. It had to do something or the other to push us back. I'm not going to leave you on a cliffhanger like last time. I had wired the starter incorrectly and given ground where power should have been and left the power dangling. So we quickly fixed that and the car had life and we had excitement. Duro? This is the very end of the journey where we started the engine after almost 4 months and it started. We will go much deeper into this emotion once we get there in the last episode. For now though, chapter transmission is over. In the next episode, we will discuss Haldex, which makes the all wheel drive magic happen, fuel tank, why we need to change it, where to get it. So stay tuned and I will see you in the next one.